Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna stay in the realm of JavaScript and I'm gonna talk about something called prototype pollution gadgets today. <coughs> this is a joint work between me, Mikhail, and Mozart from KTH. So let me first introduce inheritance in JavaScript or what prototypes are. A prototype of an object is basically the parent of an object. And in JavaScript, any object, if it wants to have a parent, can just reverence this parent in a special way. And if you create an object with a prototype, yeah, this just was the a reference. And this reference is usually stored in this property called proto. If you now access some property, JavaScript first checks the own properties of the object and then it looks in the prototype. And that is how inheritance works basically. So what's interesting here is that when you create an object like this, like curly braces normally, then this actually has a default prototype. This is called the object prototype and has some utility functions like toString. Importantly, this is also just an object, and every object references this same object. It's always the same object. Oh, I pressed the wrong button here. Okay, so what's the problem with this? So this is just a property. You can just access it like a property. Now let's have a look at this small example. This is some functions, a project data that takes some query from a user. Okay, let's say that runs on a Node.js server. Um, and this data in this function is stored in a local object that is sent from the user. This, lo this uh, object is created normally, so it has the same prototype. So now let's say a user, which is not, who is not so nice, sends some specific data. First for the org, so the first, uh, the first read, he sends proto. What happens here is that this returns this default object prototype, right? So now he can set the other data as he wishes and can set any property on the object pro uh, prototype. So now that is written and it stays written, right? So now let's say there is another function on the server which runs some command. This is not publicly available. The options parameter here is not use, uh, controlled. So at some point on the server, this is called with an empty object. And again, this is the same object that it defines as a, pro uh, as a prototype. So the developer thought of this, we don't have the bin property defined, so we default to some default executable. But when JavaScript now actually checks, is this bin property defined on this empty object? It is now magically because it has it in the prototype chain. It returns the value and executes it. And we have an RC in a part of the code that is usually not attacker controlled in any way. This first part where we write the property is called a prototype pollution. There's already some really good work on this, uh, this which mostly shows how we can pollute it and how it, can leads to how it leads to crashes then. So, and the second part, the, where it actually leads to some high profile um, exploit, this is called the prototype pollution gadget, and this is what we focus on. In particular, we ask the question, how prevalent are these gadgets in the NPM, in the Node.js ecosystem? And how can we um, performantly identify them? For this, we present a semi-automatic pipeline for Node.js applications that starts with some setup and then does a dynamic taint analysis. This we have implemented in a, cool, in a tool we call Dusty. The output of Dusty is then manually verified with a proof of concept. The setup is quite straightforward. We just fetch the source repository of an NPM package and install the dependencies. We use the source repository instead of the NPM provided package because we need the tests. We run the analysis on the tests. Why do we do that? First, they give often good coverage, but more importantly, they have realistic use cases. If you remember the function from before, no attacker, uh, no input was attacker controlled. So we cannot change the input apart from the polluted prototype. So this is why these gadgets have to occur naturally in the normal execution. Um, here is a short slide on the instrumentation stack, which I think is quite interesting. I don't have time to go into detail here, really, but we use an instrumentation tool no, called NoProf by Sonidal, which runs on, on the Truffle Graal chess language, which in turn runs on Graal VM. So dynamic taint analysis, I'm not sure if you, if you know it. So the, the general idea is, that we, we want to track the flow from some attacker controlled value, in this case a polluted prototype, to some sync. Uh, this is some, some dangerous function where it leads to an exploit. Um, 
So let's have a look at this example again from before this small <coughs> run function and see how we implemented it. So when we read this property, we first check, hey, does it uh, access the object prototype? If it does, we know, okay, this is a source. We now have to track this. Um, we still wait a little bit and we wait till, till we know what the expected value is and then we inject an object into the runtime. This is our taint value, which wraps the expected value. This is now passed automatically through most of the, most of the code. Uh, we also do some, some implementation of, of type coercion and, and we also in instrument stuff like a string concatenation. So we have proper taint propagation. This proxy is now, this object is now passed through the code and reaches some sync. In this case, this uh, exec sync function which executes the command. We record it and since we do not instrument the Node.js code itself, we just instrument the application code as well as the, as well as the, all its dependencies, we have to unwrap it first. So we, we, we don't, it doesn't lead to some crashes. Okay, so we use this analysis in three parts. So we start with a short optional pre-analysis where we filter out all packages that we do not need to save some time. Uh, these are packages that do not use the Node.js API. Then we do an unintrusive analysis, and finally we do a force branch uh, analysis. So the unintrusive run is one run where we inject all, all the taints, all the sources in, at the same time. Because this leads to undefined behavior, right? You have a lot of objects in there. We try to be as, as unintrusive as possible to find a lot of flows without crashing the tests. Um, we do that by returning this wrapped value, this expected value, when we reach uh, branchings, conditionals. So here on the right, you see, you see the example where we return a taint when we read the property, and when we read the conditional, we unwrap it so we do not go into the branch. There are obviously flows that rely on these conditional changes. So for this, we do something we call force branch execution, where we now enforce the execution of specific branches. For this, we record all the all the conditionals that relied on that relied on polluted properties, and now take one and then reverse the conditionals. Like you see here on the right, right, we have this undefined value, but now when we reach the conditional, we reverse it, we return true, so the, for, the branch is forcibly executed. We still inject all the other taints, so we we can find flows that rely on multiple uh, polluted properties. The output of our analysis is stored in database, and then we do some prioritization, mostly on things, so we focus on things that lead to some high profile attacks like the executable, uh, execute command from before. We also output something called seri format, this, this allows us to visualize the flows nicely in, the, in an IDE here, Visual Studio Code, and then we create a proof of concept. So, for our analysis, we looked at over 9,000 NPM packages. We looked at the most depend upon NPM packages because we assumed that they are quite popular. Of these, around 2,000 passed is pre-filtering, so they are interesting for us. From the, they are intended for the Node.js for Node.js server-side applications. And of these 2,000, we find 1,300 with some flows. Okay, now for the manual verification, we focus on arbitrary code and command execution gadgets, so we uh, focus on things like evil, or, or like the aforementioned exec sync. And we are able to find 49 actually high profile gadgets, 16 arbitrary code executions, 26 arbitrary command injections, and seven local file inclusions. And here's a full list, it, you probably can't really read it, I just want to show it because uh, we, I think we found some quite interesting stuff. We, for example, found one in EGS, this DR line 10, that is a really popular HTML templating framework um, and there we have an AC. And we also have a node mailer, which is a quite popular mailing framework. Um, to, de to demonstrate the danger, it says usefulness here, but it should actually say danger of the uh, end to end uh, of the gadgets. We try to identify an end to end exploit. We focus on Kibana in this case. Since our tool uh, only finds the gadgets, we still needed to find the pollution part, right? So for this, we utilize a tool by Mikhail, the co-author, co uh, that is called Science Spring, that is able to find the pollution part, and it actually finds one. We then go on to look at the packages that are used by Kibana and are used by the, 
uh, and uh, we found where we found gadgets in our experiment, and we saw that the aforementioned node mailer actually has an AC. So we, by combining them, we managed to find a new uh, critical CV that leads to an RC. So final thought, do we still have time? Yep. Very good. Okay, so, the final, so some final thoughts. Um, as you have seen in, from the results, prototype pollution gadgets can lead to really serious vulnerabilities. Okay, they need the pollution part, but still the gadgets themselves should also be uh, mitigated in some way. So mitigation in general, obviously you can mitigate the pollution by checking, do, by checking prototype re, uh, rights mainly, but the problem is if you miss one of these, one pollution, it might suffice to trigger the gadgets because in long running software such as Node.js servers, as soon as it is polluted, it stays polluted. So the, so the gadget can be triggered at some point very, very different. There is actually a language level mitigation in, in work at Google. They try to mitigate the pollution part, but this uh, probably still takes some time. And you can check out the work. Uh, you can check out the tool. You can run it on your, on your, if you're a developer, you can run it on your application. And you can also check out the gadgets if you want for whatever reason. And that's it for me. Thank you.